Ah. Now we are live. <laughs> Welcome yes. everybody to this opening talk in the 11th edition of RoboTrader. RoboTrader is an educational program offered by UPM, by Universidad Politécnica de Madrid. It's my pleasure to introduce you our speaker today, Perry Kaufman. Perry agreed to give us a talk and I want to thank him for, for it. Thank you, Perry, very much. I don't think Perry needs any introduction to this audience, but nevertheless, as I have his last book uh, here called Kaufman Constrat, Constructs Trading Systems, I want to use it for, for that. Perry <laughs> Kaufman is a financial engineer well known for developing algorithmic trades for the global equity and futures markets. And as a rocket scientist in the aerospace industry, Mr. Kaufman has applied his broad knowledge and experience in computers in technology to trading methods, risk analysis for institutional and commercial applications. Mr. Kaufman is the, is the author of Trading System and Methods. First published in 1978, the most authoritative and comprehensive work in the industry. He's the managing director of KaufmanSignals.com, training individuals and institutions with financial market products. For more information, for more information to contact Mr. Kaufman, go to his website www.kaufmansignals.com. And now it's all yours. Is your your time. Thank you, Mr. Perry Kaufman. Well, thank you. Welcome, everybody. I'm sorry that uh, I can't do this in Spanish. I would love to, but my Spanish is limited, as I told Professor Lopez, to ordering tapas. So let's talk about today. We're, we're going to talk about, oops, let's, let us see if I can, oops, hmm. I'm trying to right. yes, to go to the first slide. Yes, let me uh, now. Now we have it. Ah, okay. Sorry about that. Today we're going to talk about risk. Let me mention that risk is as important as profits. If if you have a system that appears very profitable but it loses 50%, you won't have anyone trading it. And so you need to concentrate on risk. And th there's an old saying in the market that if you control the risk, the profits will take care of themselves. And I believe most of that. So let's move forward and talk about risk. I have many things on the list today. And you should know that when we're done, Professor Lopez will send a copy of this presentation to you, so you don't need to copy it. Now, here are a few reminders. First, question everything. So even though I'm going to tell you all sorts of wonderful things, you need to test them yourself. You can't even believe me because we tend to pick good examples when we show you these, uh, these rules and, and market situations. Know when it's too good to be true. I see a lot of systems that do wonderfully well. I've seen a system that has no losses and of course just can't be true. You can move your profits and losses around. You can have a lot of small losses. You can have a few big losses, but you can't eliminate them. So you want to verify everything. You want to start small. The best way to control risk is to invest a small amount to start with and get used to the idea of losing money. The best thing you can really do when you start trading is to have a few losses. That will, that will get you used to the idea that you don't make money on every trade. 
And last, remember that this is a business, not a hobby. Take it seriously, put work into it. You don't want to lose money. So let me give you a little story first. Our daughter trades commodities. My wife trades commodities. We all trade commodities. When she was on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, uh, one of the brokers asked her if she wanted to make some money, he would trade for her. And so she gave him $100. And at the end of the day, she made 300 It was wonderful. She loved it. She was so excited. She couldn't stand it. The next day, she gave him $200, and she lost 600 And she was so sick, she couldn't go to work for three days. So that, uh, that is a true story. And the lesson, as I say at the bottom, is that you need to know the risk of what you're doing. Just because you make one profit does not mean that you won't lo- lose more. So let's look at, at volatility. Volatility and risk are the same thing. And one thing you need to know is that volatility and volume chase each other. So you'll see that uh, when the volume picks up in, in a stock or in the futures market, the volatility will increase as well. They go together. And I think I'll, I'll be showing you a system a little later that takes advantage of that. Now, I just want to give you some examples of markets that we've been trading that are really exciting but have incredible amounts of risk. I mean, look at this example of Tesla and uh, Nikola. And you have to ask yourself, where would you buy this stock? Where would you sell it? And how do you control the risk? When, When the market moves this fast, this high, it is very difficult to control the risk. So we're going to talk about how you do that. And some other examples. Here is uh, Bitcoin. Bitcoin has been incredibly risky. Now, I have a little system that trades it, um, and, and I can share it with you. It's not in this presentation. But again, you look at this and you say, well, it's great if I can make all this money on the way up with Bitcoin, but what about going down? And what about all these stocks that that have been trading lately, like uh, GameStop? Uh, it's, it's fine if you make money on the way up, but again, there's always, there's always a time when the market comes back and bites you. And so you have to be very careful. Anytime there's great profit potential, There's also great risk in trading. Here's uh, cannabis, another wonderful opportunity that didn't turn out to be so good. When you look at these charts, try to think of where you would buy, where would you sell, and how do you avoid those gigantic swings in equity? So here are some reasons why I don't trade those stocks. New stocks have very high volatility. And again, volatility means high risk. They don't have enough history for me to evaluate them and to test them to find out what kind of strategy I can use. And I am fully algorithmic, which means that all my trading is done using computer models. I don't vary from them. And so I need enough data to know what I should do during these risky situations. And if there isn't enough data, I don't trade them. Also remember a new stock that has an IPO is usually inflated 
because the underwriting broker pushes the stock up to get as much money as possible when they go public. So you fully expect volatility and some decline after an IPO. In a study I did, it showed that it took one to two years after an IPO for a company to make profits. It just takes them time to figure out what to do with the money and how to apply it. Listening to the news or broker recommendations is not a good way to trade. Brokers always sound smart the day after, and they want you to trade. They have a conflict of interest. They want you to trade as much as possible. So again, at the bottom, I just want to remind you, no matter how much money your system makes, if it loses 50% somewhere along the way, no one will be there to trade it. You won't be there to trade it. I remember in, 19, in, in 2008, in the financial crisis, uh, profits dropped, or the, the S&P dropped 50%. But a few years later, when the S&P made new highs, all the brokers would say, well, if you stayed with that trade, you'd now be profitable. Unfortunately, nobody stayed with the trade because 50% is too much. When it goes down 50%, you wonder whether it will go down 75%. So you get out. So just a few words of philosophy. The main one is keep it simple. Simple things work just as well as complex things probably better. The more rules you have, the less likely it is to work. Let me, whoops. sorry about that. Whoop. They're persistent, just let it go. The phrase that I use that I think is important is loose pants fit everyone. So that if you make a model that has a lot of room, it doesn't look so good on paper, but it will forecast what you will do realistically. So if you try to have too many rules and try to make your system perfect, it will not work in the future. That you have to accept the risk of the system. So, and further down, I say, don't fool with the results. You can force things to look better by eliminating a bad trade, by engineering a rule, but it won't work in the future. A good friend of mine says, if you torture the data enough, it will tell you anything. So that is, my philosophy, too simple over complex, mainly because if something goes wrong with your trading model, you need to understand why it happened and how to fix it. If the program is too complex, you'll never figure that out. So you deal with risk first by starting small. It's really important that you start with a small investment. And it's also important that you actually trade the market because pay, while paper trading is a good way to see if your system works, if you don't actually lose money in the market, you won't take it realistically. There's nothing that wakes you up more than a real loss. And it, it, keeps, it, it keeps you honest. Uh, also, I forgot this other point that no matter what you do to, to check out your system, your losses in real life will be larger than your test shows. And it's always true statistically as you go forward in time, the profits will be bigger, the losses will be bigger, the runs of profits, the runs of losses. Everything gets bigger over time because there's more data. So let's just start with how do you measure risk? You probably 
already know that the standard financial way is to take the standard deviation of the daily returns times the square root of 252. That the 252 annualizes it. If you use the weekly returns, you multiply it by the square root of 52. The other way of doing it is to take what we call the average true range. The average true range is simply the daily range extended to the previous close if we had a gap opening that wasn't filled. So I use the 20 day average true range and I use the 20 day annualized standard deviation, which is the same as the as the calculation they, they use for S&P options. Now, these two measures of risk are both very good. And here's what they look like. Uh, on the left is the annualized volatility of the S&P, and on the right is the average true range. They do differ, but they do spike at the same point, but with different amounts. I'll show you that we use these two measurements for different purposes. Uh, and of course, you know that on the left, the S&P spikes to nearly 100%, which is not realistic. I mean, volatility will not be 100%. But because we're using 20 days and annualize it, these values can look distorted. It still works if we continually use the same measurement, it will work for whatever we do. Now, before we go further, let's just back up and talk about trend following. Excuse me, I need a drink of water here. Trend following is very important. And even if you don't use it to trade, you will use it to filter trading systems because you will always improve a system by trading on the correct side of the trend. Let me also mention that trends really only exist in the long term. When you see the price move fast in one direction, as it did with GameStop, that's not a trend. That's supp short term supply demand. Trends are produced by fundamental factors like interest rate policy. So our Federal Reserve, your central bank, decides that uh, the economy needs stimulation, so it lowers rates. And, and then it looks to see if it helped the economy. And if it didn't do quite what they wanted, they lower it again. And they keep doing it until it accomplishes what they want. And that produces trends in interest rates. Trends in interest rates affect the stock market, and it affects, it, it affects Forex prices. Because money moves to the countries with the highest yield in their interest rate, given the stability of the country. So money moves around seeking the highest interest rate. And so you get trends that start in the interest rates, move to the Forex, and benefit in the index markets. Because when people move money into the US because they have higher interest rates, they invest in either bonds or the stock market. So those trends are reflected in all of the major markets. The three most popular trending methods are the moving average, which you probably all know already, a breakout, which is buying a new high, selling a new low, or a linear regression slope. And I assure that Professor Lopez already went over this, and when you're doing models, you have used one or the other of these. All right, they are all well-defined. You can look at them there. And I'll just show you some pictures of them so that you know that in this case, this is the moving average. And you, I, I sell when the moving average turns down, not when the prices cross the moving average, because the prices will cross back and forth, and that will give you a lot of false signals. The moving average turns out to be better 
if you're a long-term trader, if you're looking for the long-term trend, if you're using a moving average in the short term, 10 or 15 days, you do want to use the price crossing the trend line because you want to remove the lag of the trend line. So there are qualifications, even though I believe the long-term trend is most important, there are different ways to use the trading signals. For the breakout, you're selling, as you can see at the top, you're selling a, a breakout of support, and at the bottom, you're buying a breakout of resistance. And the risk of this is the difference between the breakout of the resistance, the breakout at the bottom, and where you would where it would turn down again. So the risk for the breakout system is quite high, uh, but you'll see that it has other advantages. I'll show you in a minute. Linear regression slope is a bit harder to show because it draws a straight line and it constantly changes that each day to follow the slope of the prices. We normally just look at the direction of the slope. And so while, while it is intended to simulate these straight lines, uh, we don't really bother with that. We only look at the direction of the slope. Now, this is really the important part, because I'm, I'm sure you're not particularly interested in the trends. Here, is, here are the results of using the three different trend following methods applied to the US 30 year bonds with an 80 day time period. And you'll see over this period of 20 years, they all perform about the same. And so the conclusion that you need to draw is that it's not as important which moving average you use. What's important is that the market trends, I, I said moving average, I meant it doesn't matter which trend following method you use, all of them work when the market trends, none of them work when the market doesn't trend. So you don't wanna spend an awful lot of time trying to figure out which trend you wanna use. Pick one that you're happy with, moving average, breakout, doesn't matter, and then stick to it and work on other aspects of rich, rich risk management. So let's look at what makes these systems different in terms of risk and reward. <clears throat> we see that along the top line that all of them made about the same return, which you also saw in the graph. The difference is the profit factor you'll see is the in this case, I used uh, TradeStation, which doesn't give you a sharp ratio, which is a nicer measurement, but just divides the gross profit divided by the gross loss to give you a profit factor. And unfortunately, it also uses the value only at the end of the trade. So you don't get the intraday drawdown. But I've shown that along the bottom so in order to correct that. <clears throat> you'll see the number of trades in the moving average is much higher. Moving average is called a conservation of capital method. It stays with a trade when it does well, and it gets out quickly when it goes the wrong way. So it has a lot of small losses and a few very big profits. So you see the percentage of good trades is only 39%, and yet it made the same amount of money as the other two systems, because it stays with the good trades. On the other hand, the breakout system in the middle had 72% good trades, only 18 trades, because it stays with the trade and allows the, the profits and losses to jump around. Remember that 
you go long on a new high and short on a new low. So the risk is very high. But because of that, it allows the market to move around and usually makes a profit. You just have to be able to handle the risk. And if you look at the bottom, the risk is a little higher than the other systems because it does allow the market to flop around. And the linear regression is somewhere in between those two. So we won't uh, spend too much time. Linear regression is good, but it's not as popular as either the moving average or the breakout. But look at these statistics later. So you have a good idea of the difference between these two methods. They're quite different, and yet they make the same amount of money. Now, the next thing is position sizing. I trade a portfolio of stocks. I trade a portfolio of futures markets. And it's extremely important that we size the positions so that every trade has the same risk as every other trade. And this is one of the most important parts of risk control. If you, tr if you put more money on any one stock or any one futures market, then that market trade has to do better than any of the others. Otherwise, you're just putting more risk on the trade. The best way to diversify is to have equal risk in every trade. That way, each trade can participate equally in the result. So how do you do that? The way you do it for stocks is to si simply divide your investment by the number of stocks you're going to trade, then divide that by the closing price of the stock. Now, it's a very crude way of, of allocate, <clears throat> allocating equally. And I'm going to show you in a minute that, that unfortunately, low price stocks are more volatile than high price stocks. Because of that, I don't trade stocks that are under $10 because they're too risky. Now for futures, futures work a lot better. First, you keep 50% of your investment in reserve. Then you put an equal allocation into each market. And you do that by an either dividing the average true rate, dividing the allocation by the dollar value of the average true range or dividing the allocation by the margin. I may not have said this right. I see in the description, it may not be quite right. Um, I may need to correct that before you get this. But the point is that we're trying to get an equal amount of risk in every trade that we make. And here's an example. <clears throat> if, if, if we were to trade um, 10 shares of Amazon at 2,700, I have no idea what it is. I did this a month or so ago. It could be a 10,000 by now. And, and 10 shares of Alibaba at 290, and each returned 1%, then Amazon would have made $270 and Alibaba $29, pretty not the same proportion. Now that's great if, if you're actually trading those and Amazon made 270, but if the opposite happened, you would not be so happy. And so you need to trade an equal amount. Now, here's a little chart of, of uh, volatility, returns versus price, and price difference versus price to show you that on the left are the percentage returns and on the right are the absolute difference. So when the Amazon price gets very high, obviously the difference between the high and low for the day is going to increase. But on the left, it shows you that it does not increase 
at the same percentage. So the percentage of, of uh, returns is gigantically high when the price is down at $10 or $20 or something low. And it does not increase at, at the same rate when the price gets high. So since we're dealing in percentages, we want to pay attention to the chart on the left, which says low price stocks are too volatile. And I've done this for many stocks, Bank of America, any stock looks almost identical. The risk is extremely high when you trade low price stocks and it's very hard to control. So avoid low price stocks. Now, the reason why we get this concept in the stock market that there is a relationship between, uh, let's call it a log normal relationship between price and volatility. It comes from the futures markets. On the right, I show you the relationship between corn and volatility, which is exactly what we would like to see. As the price gets higher, the volatility increases, but at a slower rate. And you can see in corn on the left, the price goes up and it comes back down because corn has a, has a fundamental price. It has a cost of production. Stocks do not have that. Stocks can keep going up forever. And so it's very hard to have this same relationship. But I just want to say that in graduate economics, they keep pushing this log normal relationship of prices to volatility. And it is not true. So here are some examples of finding your position size for stocks at the top. These were all US stocks where I just took a $100,000 investment. I divided it by five to get $20,000 and then divided by the price. And then you see the position size. When the volatility or the, when the price is high, you trade fewer stocks, a uh, fewer, uh, smaller position size. On the bottom, I do it in mixed currencies. And, and so you'll see, you can do it yourself. It's, uh, I tried to show all the numbers. I showed the FX value here so that you can see how you arrive at the position size. You want to go through that yourself. You want to be sure you do that when you do your own trading. In futures, it's a bit more complicated. Um, in this case, I show that we use the margin and not the average true range. You can use either one. They come out about the same. Uh, margin is 10%. I use margin as 10% of the contract value. Uh, the exchanges set the margin, but I find 10% of the contract value is more realistic. And again, you'll see. Euro stocks, which has the lowest volatility, you trade more. And markets like NASDAQ, which has higher volatility, you trade less. We won't go through the calculations. It will bore you to tears. So just remember, as the position size goes up, your risk goes up. You want to control that. Here's a, just a picture using gold of what happens. Uh, the position size is in blue and the cash price of gold is in, is in gold. And I do that in the cash price because the futures are back adjusted and it makes it a bit difficult to, uh, to show this uh, relationship. But you see on the far right, as the cash price goes up, the position size goes down. And that's really all. On the left, you see that the uh, cash price was low, so the position size varied up and down. 
based on how the uh, price vary. But as the price got much higher, the position size got much smaller. Let's talk more about volatility. I'm not sure if you follow the VIX. VIX is the implied volatility of S&P futures. Uh, I just want to point out that VIX is interesting. It You would think it would be very useful, but it's really not as useful as you would like. Um, VIX is not tradable. It does show you what the options traders think about volatility. Uh, the tradable ETF is called UVXY. And the interesting thing is that both VIX and UVXY spend more of their time, I think 65% of their time, declining. So there are 65% of the time they trade lower. Um, the typical strategy for VIX is to sell high volatility because volatility comes down quickly. It goes up fast, comes down slowly. Oh, I didn't mean to say it comes down quickly, but it comes down steadily. Um, this was an example of uh, the British vote on Brexit, which was a, a few years ago. But everybody knew the vote was going to come, and most people thought it was going to be stay in the European Union, but everybody agreed that it would be volatile. So you see on the top, the volatility goes up, but in UVXY, which is tradable, all the traders were anticipating the high volatility and that they would make money by selling it. So the volatility hardly went up at all. So there was much less opportunity to actually make money. And I just wanted to show you the difference between the a non-tradable options implied volatility and what the traders actually do. So you have to pay attention to the market you're trading. It doesn't mean you can't make money doing it, but you're going to make far less than you expect. Now let me explain how I pick which markets are trending and which, which markets are good for mean reversion or the opposite of trending. And that depends on what I call market noise. When a market has a lot of noise, it means it goes up and down erratically. When it has low noise, it is trending. And I measure this the way we measure what's called the drunken sailor's walk. And, and the idea is that when the sailor leaves his ship for the evening to go to the pub, he goes straight to it. Very efficient, straight line. When he returns in the evening, depending on how late he stayed, his path is not so good, as you can see on the right. So what we're going to do is we're going to divide the straight line path on the left by the zigzag path on the right to get what we call noise or a ratio of noise. And we're going to use that ratio and we're going to measure it over 20 days and we're going to average those 20 days over a long period of time. And what I've done is I'm going to show you measurement of noise for futures markets. When the value of the ratio is high, there is less noise. Okay, because it means that the zigzag pattern wasn't as erratic. And you'll see then on the left, less noise or a higher ratio means less noise, more trending. On the right, it says uh, more noise, less trending. And you'll see the cluster of markets on the left are mostly interest rates. Interest rates stay close to 
the central bank policy. And so they tend to be smoother and trending. On the right, you get Euro stocks as the noisiest of all markets, which means that it's going to be a very good candidate for mean reversion trading or taking profits frequently, getting in, getting out. So you'll see that the index markets are, are the greatest candidates for, for mean reversion trading. In the middle, you'll see the markets vary. Sometimes they're mean reverting, sometimes they're trending. But if you want the best markets for trending, they're on the left. The best markets for mean reversion are on the right. And to show you that, I took an 80-day moving average of your eyebore, which is one of the best trending markets, and show you the results of just a simple moving average system on the left. And it does quite well. And then I took the same 80-day moving average of Euro stocks, which was on the far right, and it clearly does not do well. So that there is a relationship between uh, the noise and your ability to make money using a trending system. Now let's move on to profit taking because profit taking is a way to reduce risk. And then we'll, we'll discuss stop losses for a bit. Profit taking is done by setting your profit level at the entry price plus or minus a profit factor times the 20 day average true range. I mentioned the average true range was similar to the daily range of trading. And the profit factor tends to be good at about three. And over the years, I've done this for many years, the profit factor remains best beach at, at that level of, of, of about three. I'm going to show you some, some uh, examples of that. But of course, the ATR allows that, that um, profit target to get bigger if the volatility gets bigger and, the, and get smaller if the volatility get smaller, so it adapts to the volatility of the market. Um, now, one of the problems I'm, I'm going to mention is that you don't want to use profit taking if you're a long-term trend follower, because to be profitable in the long term, you must capture what we call the fat tail. The fat tail are those, those stocks and futures price moves that just kept going. For example, interest rates. Interest rates came down. Bonds went up for almost 30 years. And the profits generated by the futures markets were gigantic. But if you took profits, you wouldn't be in it. You'd get some small profit, and then you'd miss the trade you'd have to figure out how to get back into the trade. And that is more complicated than just staying in the trade. So profit taking doesn't work for long-term trends, but always works for short-term trading. Short-term trading deals with noisy markets, in and out, in and out, three days, five days. So when the price moves in your direction, you want to capture profits, and then get back in some other time. So having distinguished that, let me also tell you that we set a profit target at three ATRs, but that's only, that's one value. And the market is not that predictable. So instead of using just three ATRs, what we use is three different values. Of course, you need a position big enough to have three values, so you have to have at least three contracts, or you have to be trading stocks and divide your position into three parts. 
But here I've shown you profit targets set at 1.5, 3, and 5. And they average 3.16. So I'm very close to the 3. And I, I learned this because my wife is a floor trader and a day trader. And this is what she does. And the advantage of these three parts is that once you get one profit level, even small, you've reduced your exposure. And so you're going to lose less if the market goes against you. You put some money in your pocket. If you get two profit levels, you will never turn a profit into a loss. And so in this case, you'll see that in, in some cases we get all three, in some cases we get only one, in some cases we get out too early. But the other important issue is that when you're out of the market and you've taken your profits, you're not exposed to additional risk. So if there's a price shock, you have avoided it. And believe me, the amount of time you spend out of the market is very important because that time lowers your overall risk exposure. So if you have a choice of a system that makes the same amount of money, but one is in 50% of the time and one is in all the time, you want to pick the one that's in 50% because the time you're out of the market is important. Okay. So much for profit taking. Now let's talk about stops. A lot of people use trailing stops. Um, they do work. I don't generally use them because if I'm trend following, again, I just follow the trend. I get out on what I call the natural stop. But if you're going to use a stop, there are good ways and bad ways to use it. Again, you do not want to use a stop loss if you're a long-term trend follower for the same reason that we don't use profit taking. If you get stopped out by saying, I don't want to lose more than $250 or $500, that has nothing to do with the trend. So you get stopped out, but the trend is still up. And then the market goes up and you sit there without a position watching what would have been the system make a lot of money. So if you get stopped out again, you would need to have a way to get back in. I find that unnecessary. I just stay with the trend. I'm going to manage my risk in a different way. I'll show you in a few minutes. If you're going to use a stop loss, the best stop loss is called a trailing stop. And I show you the calculations. It follows the highest high of the trade minus a factor, again, maybe three times the 20 day ATR. I'll show you a picture of it. So there is the, the red dots would be the trailing stop. And we only use the trailing stop on the close of prices. We don't apply it to the low because the low of the day can be very erratic and very volatile. And there are an awful lot of false signals on the low. So we use the close because when the market makes a sharp low, it usually reacts back up by, by the end of the day. So you take advantage of the noise and you can avoid getting stopped out. But this is the, what the trailing stop looks like if you apply it the way I've just explained to you. In this case, the profit factor was 2.5. And this, this is the DAX. All right, so I won't go into it anymore because the formula is quite clear. You can try it yourself. I'm sure you're all capable of doing this on either a trading platform or on a spreadsheet. Again, this is a reminder about the fat tail. These are the markets that make all the money. You can have 20 losses 
and trade Apple or trade the Euro dollar or trade Amazon or trade NASDAQ and make such a big profit that they offset all of the gigantic losses. So you have to be patient. You know, being a trader, you have to understand that you're going to take losses and that most of it is going to be offset by these uh, very large, very profitable moves. Uh, wait, I just need another drink. <coughs> Excuse me. There's a book that was written recently called The Psychology of Money, and it explains in very nice terms that you only have to be right on one item to offset the losses on many, and that's where all the profits are made. So let's look at volatility again. The purpose of this is just to show that uh, here's the S&P and NASDAQ volatility. Uh, they, they track track each other, and you'll find that using annualized volatility or the ATR does the same thing. You can, you can track volatility if you don't want to calculate it yourself. You'll find by going on the internet, you can find the history of volatility on most of these markets. And you're going to want to do that because when you're trading, I get out of my trade when the underlying uh, volatility of a stock goes above a certain level. I usually use 50%, but in some stocks like Tesla, I've used 90%. So if the volatility of Tesla goes on under over 90%, even if I'm making money, I get out because the risk is not worth the reward. And I have proved myself time and again that it's worthwhile to do that. Now with Euro stocks or the FTSE, you'll find that the, the uh, because it's an index, the volatility <clears throat> at 50% will be quite reasonable. But with individual stocks, you may find that 90% is a better judge. So <clears throat> this is just repeating the fact that, that um, I strongly believe and I prove to myself that trading a stock with when the volatility is over 90% is a bad idea. You'll make a little bit of money but you'll expose yourself to a great deal of risk. And so I get out, especially if I think of it as taking profits. Now, here's a simple mean reversion system that takes advantage of the concept of market noise. And you should do this yourself. Um, what you want to do is find a stock that has a lot of noise. Find a market like the S&P or the FTSE, which is very noisy, or Euro stocks. <clears throat> and let's, let's see. Let me show you. Here's an example. Um, on the left, we see markets with noise. Um, the S&P, NASDAQ, and Euro stocks. And notice, this is a test where the moving average calculation period is along the bottom. And you'll see with the fast moving averages, they lose money. But there is a long term trend that shows up on the right as the calculation period gets longer. On the other hand, stocks that have lower volume, less liquidity, tend to have a stronger trend. It's an interesting phenomena um, that if you trade a market, an index market from an emerging country, it's just come on, it will have a much stronger trend. As the market gets more mature and the everyday investor joins in and buys and sells, 
it adds noise because these people have no particular pattern. They get in and out because they want to, because they need money, because they're investing more money every month from their retirement account. And that adds noise. See the Dax and the Hang Seng make money using trend following almost everywhere. But the S&P, NASDAQ, and Euro stocks do not. We're going to take advantage of the short end of this, down at the 5 to 10-day moving average, and recognize that you lose money if you trend follow it in, in the short term. So what we're going to do is we're going to do the opposite of what it tells you to do. Let me just see the next slide. Okay, the, these are the rules. I call it fade the trend. I'm going to use the 100-day moving average to tell me the direction of the market. And I'm going to use the six-day moving average to tell me that, that the system is going to do the wrong thing. Remember from the chart, the six-day moving average lost money for the S&P, NASDAQ, and Euro stocks. So when the six-day moving average says buy, we want to sell. When it says sell, we want to buy. So because we're going to follow the 100-day moving average, and because there's an upwards bias in the market, we're only going to buy. So we will buy when the six day moving average says sell, but the 100 day moving average is up. So we will be buying in the direction of the long term trend when the short term trend goes the wrong way because we have every expectation that the six day signal is bad. And so remember, on the left, we apply the 80-day moving average to euro stocks, and we got this terrible result. If we apply the 100-day moving average to euro stocks for the trend, and we do the opposite of the six-day moving average, we can turn that horrible-looking performance into some pretty nice performance on the right. And this is without trying to filter it with a high volatility or something else. These are no stops, no profit taking. But it shows you that you can take advantage of the noise of the market if you recognize that markets do have noise. Some markets trend, some markets don't. Some markets trend in the long term and not in the short term and take advantage of those combinations. So that was a very simple trend following approach. And, and this, I think I'm just repeating the rules here. And just, just uh, a word about diversification. Major funds, Futures funds in particular um, seem to feel as though they need to trade all of the money that's invested with them. And some of these funds are very, very big. And they cannot, they have more money than the market will absorb. And so they add markets to their portfolio that have small profits but more risk just because they want to trade all the money. I strongly advise you to trade only those markets that are doing well. For example, I just show you the rate of improvement when you diversify. Once you have more than four markets in your portfolio, you've really diversified quite a lot. After that, the improvement becomes smaller and smaller. 
when you have more than 10 uh, stocks in your portfolio, you gain very little. So my optimum portfolio in, in stocks is 10. And if I can't find stocks that are working, I don't trade them. So I don't mind having money sitting on the side because when I do, I'm not exposed to risk. So be very careful about trying to over diversify. I really believe that some of these major funds are hurting themselves by trying to use all their money. They would do better earning interest on part of it and trading only those things that work best. Oh, I think I've done it. And a little advertising, these are uh, two of the books that do the best for me. Uh, you'll find them at, on Amazon. The one on the left may be a bit much. It has 1,200 pages, covers everything possible. One on the right is more, more of what we talked about today. And there you are. I want to thank you, those of you that managed to put up with all this for so long. Uh, Professor Lopez, are you there? Yes, I'm still here, <laughs> hearing you with attention. <laughs> very good, very good presentation. And uh, now I think we have time for questions. And uh, while you, while people think about questions, I, I'm going to ask you. You are lucky because all your family work in the markets, <laughs> your wife, your daughter. Yes. But there are... They are, so we, all, few, we all trade. There are so few women dedicated to trading. Why do you think that that's... What's the reason for, for that? I'm sorry, could you... I was just looking at some of the yeah. comments that were very nice. I'm sorry, was there a question? Yes, that, why do you think there are so few women that are traders? <laughs> Not in uh, your case, but in general, in my courses in trading, there are very few women. <laughs> yes, that, it's really too bad because actually I think that uh, women are better at thinking fast than men. This is just my personal opinion. Uh, it's also my opinion that, if you don't mind me saying, that a man should marry a woman who is smarter than he is. It makes life much easier. So, but, but no, there's no reason why women, sh women shouldn't be good traders. I know quite a few who are. Uh, I, I don't know. It's, it's too bad. It's something that we can all do. Uh, I, I do believe that you need to be very good with spreadsheets and math, not high level mathematics, but certainly arithmetic. Most of this stuff, like deciding on your position size and calculating a moving average, is not mathematics. It's, it's arithmetic. So any, anyone can, can do this. I wish I could read some of these comments. You should mention, uh, Professor Lopez, that you will be sending this to them. Yes. Yes, we will put it in the in YouTube uh, with the with the audio and the presentation. We will ah, put it there. Okay. This yes, that Alexander would be good. Korea. Yes. Anyone that just wants a copy of the uh, PowerPoint presentation can also just send an email to me. I will send it to you, but but you won't have the audio. Mm -hmm. Good. Alexander Rio said, what do you think is a good asset allocation for stocks? Dividing capital by subsector, giving greater weight to the fastest, to the fastest growing sector could be one way. I'm, I'm sorry, I heard that you wanted uh, an application to stocks, um, but I didn't hear yeah. the rest of it. 
is the asset allocation for stocks that if it, uh, it says hiding capital by subsector subsector or giving greater weight to the fastest growing sector um i'm not sure i i understand um let let me just meant perhaps i can i can help by explaining how i pick stocks um uh for, first i i trade long-term trends i trade multiple trends because just like profit taking i don't believe um i don't believe that any one trend can predict the market but i believe that trend following works and so i trade multiple trends like a 30 60 and 120 day trend and i divide my investment equally across them and that helps smooth out the result then i take the performance of the stocks that I'm monitoring, and I monitor hundreds of stocks. I take the performance and I trade the, the 10 best, the ones that have performed best on my system over the past, say, 60 or 90 days. Because I believe that in what we call persistence. Persistence means that if it's making money on your system, it will continue to make money. And so I pick the 10 best stocks that are performing on my system. And everybody can do the same for their own system. Doesn't matter whether it's trend following or divergence or, or some trading pattern. If a stock is performing well on your approach, it should continue to perform well. So if you can monitor that performance, pick the stocks that are doing the best and, and trade them. Reevaluate them every day. I evaluate them every day. And if some stock is doing better, I throw, I put that in the portfolio and throw out the stock that's doing the worst. So I'm constantly trading the best stocks and the best futures markets i do the best i do the same for futures markets i so i'm constantly trading those stocks in those futures markets that are performing the best on my system and that seems to have worked we've outperformed the market for 10 years uh, by quite a bit and and so i would encourage you to figure out how to do that with your own work. Trade the best, get rid of the worst. Does that help, uh, Professor? Yes, very much. There it is a question. Does reduce, uh, well, maybe you have the chat window. Do, do you have access to the chat window? There I do. But... A lot of questions there. The problem is that the questions disappear quickly ah, okay i have it here does reducing your position size in high volatility periods is better than not trading at all wait um I, i'm terribly sorry but for some reason it's your voice is fuzzy Oops. Ah, okay <laughs> so Good. um You'll, you'll need to repeat it's that. That is, if in high volatility periods, it's better to have a position, although it's small, than at all. Are you saying in high volatility, is it better to have a small position or not at all? Yes. Okay. Um, well, first, when the volatility is very high, as I mentioned for stocks, 90%, as we've seen in Tesla, as we've seen in these uh, recent stocks like GameStop, uh, it is better to be out completely. Um, 
Otherwise, you pick your position size with equal volatility so that you be sure that your position size is volatility adjusted. All right, so that you can tell that you should be making the same profit loss in dollars or euros every day in each market. So if one makes one stock makes a hundred euros, the other stock might lose a hundred euros, but but you shouldn't see one stock that makes five thousand euros and the other one hundred. Uh, they need to be able to offset each other. So you do that by volatility adjusting the position size. And I gave a few slides that showed how to do that. So you're either in the market with the correct position size or you're out because the volatility is too high. Good. Good. Uh, there's a question that in your experience, what is the indicator with the highest predictive power? Wait, in my, the, what, what is, wait, try that again, the highest what power? Predictive, predictive power. Oh, predict, predictive power. Was it the market? You're saying the, the system or the market? The indicator or pattern. Oh, well, an indicator is not a system. So, you can't turn a momentum indicator into a system. Uh, that doesn't work. Uh, the, the systems that have done the best over so many years are long-term trend following. Absolutely, without a doubt. And long-term trend following applied to the interest rate markets have been the best performing of all systems. You'll find that the major funds may have as much as 50% of their money in long-term trend following with interest rates. So if you want to start there, that's fine. The next best market would be Forex. You'll see that the uh, euro dollar currency is also very trending. What, what is not trending are the index markets. Even if they have had a bull, even if they've had a bull market, they are still very noisy. Good. What about cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin? What is your experience? Uh, Did, Bitcoin. You yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just created an interesting little strategy that said if you use a three-day move. If you use a three day moving average for Bitcoin and a 7% profit target, you can make money 90% of the time. So, but the only way to trade Bitcoin is to get in frequently when it goes up and get out right away because it is too risky. So, um, I, I don't see how most people can trade Bitcoin because the volatility is too high. But, but anyway, this, this idea of getting in with a fast trend of some sort and getting out with a, a constant profit, 3%, 5%, whatever it is, and staying out most of the time will produce profits. But every once in a while, you're going to get in and the market will go the other way and you'll take a big loss. So personally, I, I see Bitcoin as a supply demand market. It has no fundamental underpinning. That is, it has no actual reason for existing. It's strictly a gambling method. It is not a currency. Uh, it, it, a, a currency is based on a country's gross domestic product, its ability to trade where people 
put money into the U.S. in order to buy products or invest. Bitcoin has none of that. It has no reason why the price goes up or down except supply demand. And that may be fine. And you may want to trade it. But it is unpredictable. So there you are. Good. How many, how many simultaneous strategies do you usually use? I'm sorry, how many strategies? I Try, say that again. Do you use, yes, how many simultaneous strategies do you usually use? Strategies uh, at the same time. I saw that. Was that the message time frames? Um, I, if, if I saw the uh, question correctly, I, I use multiple time frames. When I did uh, a major, believe it or not, when I did a major fund for uh, the Royal Bank of Scotland, I used 140 different time frames. For my normal systems, I use nine. And of course, since I've programmed this all, the computer doesn't care. <clears throat> the computer doesn't care how many. Excuse me. It'll calculate nine time frames as fast as it'll calculate one. So what I have normally are multiple time frames and multiple confirmations and so i'm looking at not only do i get a trading signal on a moving average but but i have to get a continuation of that trading signal and and i find that very useful it gets me into the trade a little later but it's more reliable than taking only the first trading signal Good. Another question is, what do you think about optimal fraction or fractional Kelly for position sizing? Um, what do I think of, uh, up, was that optimal F you said? Or right. just optimal? Fractional Kelly. Oh, what do I think of it? Right. I think it's, I think it's, Bad. <laughs> uh, it it optimal F tells you how much is the optimum amount you should be trading at any one time. The problem is, while there is some truth to that, the problem is if it tells you to trade a bigger position in one stock or one futures market than another, then it exposes you to more risk in that item that you're trading more. And that is against my principle. My principle is to trade equal risk. And if you do optimal F or any other method that tells you that you should trade more in one stock than another, you expose yourself to this uneven amount of risk. You need to prove that trading more in one stock made more profit. If you can't prove that, you shouldn't be doing it. So, and I can't, I can't prove that I can pick the stock that is going to make the most money next time I trade. Okay, I wish I could see these comments. Hmm. Oh, would I give weight to different strategies based on their skewness? No, I, I only, I, first, I, I weight strategies equally the way I weight uh, markets equally. Some strategies, <clears throat> more liquidity than others. 
So if I'm doing short-term trading, I may not be able to trade as large a position as a long-term uh, trade. Uh, but no, if I want diversification, I need to trade the strategies with equal risk in the same way I trade markets with equal risk. Or at least you have to know what risk you're assigning to them. Um, skewness is, is very subtle. And skewness has a lot to do with the fat tail, which we already discussed. So if it has a big fat tail, you would be trading longer term on it. If it's relatively symmetric, it's probably a short term system. That has nothing to do with how much I want to put on each system. The success of the market, the success of, of the performance of the system is how we decide how we're going to allocate. Anything? Ah, yes, you're right. I use a 20 day ATR. I use a 20 day um, um, annualized volatility because I think that when you compare that against history, it doesn't make a difference what you use. And there are so many variables in systems that, that we don't need more. 20 days seems to be statistically sound. I use 20 days, I don't bother. Occasionally, I'll, I'll, we'll use a faster ATR if I'm day trading because I wanna know the volatility of the last three or five days as opposed to 20 days. And sometimes I'll use uh, a three month volatility if I'm looking for stability. But unless I have a particular reason, I just stick with 20 days. Anything else? Hmm. I only saw this uh, calculation window. I didn't understand the question, but I'm very pleased it's in English. <laughs> so would somebody repeat a question and perhaps, perhaps I can see it. Question, another? You have a, you, apart from your books, you have a, a book to recommend. I, I remember so there, that you said yes, something about the book that is related to. Oh, wait, there was a uh, question about the noise ratio. Uh, it's in the book. It's, uh, let me just repeat it quickly. It's, it's the net change over N days. Okay, net change over N days as a positive value divided by the sum of the individual changes, all absolute values. All right, so it's just like the drunken sailor's walk. It's the distance that you're measuring over N days divided by the path that it took over those N days, all as positive values. All right, I think you can find it online if you look up uh, efficiency ratio. Okay, and because I was talking, I missed the next uh, question here. Oh, there were two books I recommended. I forgot about that, Professor. Uh, one was The Logic of Failure, one of my favorite books. It's a study in long-term thinking. And the, the uh, side effects of your decisions, the unexpected consequences of your decisions. Very worthwhile, very fast book to read. It's short, you'll like it. It's all done with examples. The other book is this recent one I've, I've read called The Psychology of Money. <clears throat> and it's a very simple, book with very basic lessons in how to manage your own money. And if you're a young person starting out, I think it's a very worthwhile read. I read it not long ago, 
and said, I wish I had read that a long time ago. I probably wouldn't have done it, but we, we all know too much when we're young and too little when we're old. Yes, you have a lot of experience. <laughs> A lot of uh, or somebody asked about artificial intelligence. Um, it's, I, I believe in artificial intelligence. I think it'll be wonderful. I have not yet found an application for it. So it will be something for the future. The world gets more sophisticated. I, I'm sure someone will come up with a wonderful solution, but I know of no trading method at this time that uses artificial intelligence. Um, in my big book, I do make some comments and I give some examples as best I can of how it might work. And that's it. Um, yes, somebody asked about market regimes. I don't really do much about it. Uh, the question about is the market changing? Um, yes, I think the market's becoming noisier. Obviously, these latest um, games that are people playing with, uh, <clears throat> with these stocks and short selling will affect the market, but I don't affect it, think it will affect the market for very long. But you do have to keep rechecking your systems because what worked 10 years ago may not be as good. And you have to philosophize and keep asking yourself, what is changing and how can I adapt my system automatically to these changes? If it's market noise, then you have to have something in there that adapts to market noise. Certainly volatility has to change. And that's really also all of your systems should have some volatility adjustment in it to uh, to adapt to market conditions which are mostly trend and volatility two main factors ah. i i did see a question that uh, the one about time frame, I think we've really covered. That's a very good question. How do you decide it's no the system is no longer working? Um, it's a very tricky question. And you're going to have to have statistics from your system as you decide that it's worth trading. And those statistics will be the size of your drawdown, the frequency of your profits and losses, the number of losses in a row, there's not going to be a definitive answer because, because a system can have a history of no more than three or four losses in a row, but in real life could have four or five. So you're going to have to decide at what point it breaks down. And it's going to have to be a lot worse than you think. So if your system had a drawdown of 30%, you have to realistically expect it to have a future drawdown of 50% and still be okay. But there's going to be a drawdown that's unacceptable. And that's why you have to start with a smaller amount of money because all of these numbers and all of these, these profits and losses will be bigger than you expect. So it, unfortunately, there's no real way to tell you um, when a system's no longer working other than the fact that you say to yourself, it really shouldn't do this. For example, you shouldn't start out with a lot of losses. Your system should start out with a nice mix of profits and losses. If it starts out with a long series of losses, I would stop trading immediately and assess whether or not that's possible. But, but yes, you've, you've hit on one of the biggest problems is, is uh, how do you decide the system's no longer working? And I do address that in uh, my, my trading systems book, but the answer is never as clear as you would like. Ooh. Professor, I think we should go. Well, thank I you, think... Irene. I... 
Yes. yes. I, you yes, may thank mention you again who's... for the. Yeah, let, let me just say that I am happy to answer any questions from your students if they address them to me by email. Good. You have your email there on the screen, so anybody can ask a question to you by email. Thank you yes. very much, Perry. A pleasure. I hope you all have great success trading. It's a lot of fun, and with some of us, we'll make money. Good. <laughs> okay. Thank you very all much. All right. Okay, Professor. I will speak to you soon. Okay, I'm signing off. Okay, thank you. Yes. Okay, that's all for today. And we'll see next morning with Rupertacho uh, conference. Nos veremos el, el próximo lunes.